I want to preach on the subject, the victory of violence. The victory of violence. He said, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not comfortable right now. And the violent take it by force. You, it, it ain't nothing with God going to happen automatic. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to violate your theology. Lord, bless the preaching, helping to do a good job in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to rock your theological socks for just a few minutes and say a few things that you probably won't agree with, but I'm right anyway. And if I'm not right, I have the mic. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> One of the first things you need to understand, and I thank you very much for coming tonight, and I know you could be doing a million other things, but I want you to understand in your walk with God, attendance to the house of God is always secondary. Uh, that's what I thought. We usually try to make it a preeminent thing and a primary thing that you got to be in the house of God and forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, which means then that when that book was written, they had church trouble with attendance in those days too. Because he was saying, as the manner of some is. So he had some examples around him saying people laying out watching whatever they were watching. But you, you got to hear me because I got to show you something. Because if you're not careful, you can get intoxicated with just showing up. <laughs> Say, well, my job is to show up. No, 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 no. Your job ain't just to show up. Your job is to make contact. <laughs> if you show up and you don't make contact, you might as well just stay home and watch television. Yeah, you got to be here, but you got to do something when you get here. The Bible said, I will make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will shout with the voice of triumph. I will declare the greatness of the Lord. I'm not just going to show up. Oh, hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to go slow because I feel like you're going slow. And I'll go fast in just a few minutes. But what I just said, it changed the whole Pentecostal movement. Because my church family is going to gather together tomorrow morning, and most of them are just going to show up. <laughs> While I'm here, I pastor people, some good, some bad, some crazy, some okay. But a lot segment of my church shows up with leaving on their mind. They walk in the back door saying, I hope this won't take long, as if they were going to a dentist or a doctor. Man, I came here. I don't care how long it takes. I, all I know is I got to touch him, and he's got to touch me. And whatever gets in my way, I'm going to fuss with you until I get broken through. So, so I, you can be seated. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wake everybody up at once. <laughs> but so, so what I'm going to tell you right now, as kind as I can be, I've only got one night left, but as kind as I can be, do not be intimidated by some looney tune sitting next to you who's not interested. With all the hell I've been through and all the stuff God has saved me from and the things he brought me from, I ain't going to let you stare me down. You ain't going to look at me and go, we ain't going to play that game when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. You're not going to stare me down. I'm not going to let the devil hold me hostage. I'm going to break through. Yeah. 
You can sit down. I know what I'm talking about. We've got zones in our church that I call the corpse, the morgue. I'll walk out with my mic preaching, and when I get in certain sections, I'll deliberately go, Ooh. <laughs> the living dead are here. Ooh. And they think they, get, they think they get points for coming. I think I'll look at my socks a while. Well, I'm here, and it's like God says, and I'm here. <laughs> what time's the show start? And I see God saying, yeah, what time does the show start? You're not hearing me yet. <clears throat> we better get away from this attitude that we expect God to do something for us. We came to make a joyful noise. We came to magnify God. We came to move the Lord. We came to create an atmosphere that is conducive to the supernatural, to life being changed and transformed. It's us that makes the joyful noise. You, you may see, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just wandering until I find where I'm supposed to be. Folks, I don't want this being rated X. But ain't no husband that's got his head screwed on right is excited about coming home to a woman who's frigid. Now, if that's too plain for you, I'll get plainer. No man works all day long and then comes home to his wife who turns around when he goes to put his arms around her and she goes... And he says to her, well, what's wrong? And then a lion spirit gets on her and she says, nothing. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but when I've worked all day and put up with devils and demons and dingbats and loonies and I come home, I didn't come home to have a handshake. You're not hearing me yet. Now, I'm not going to get any further unless you think I'm a porno preacher. But I'm here to tell you, when I come home, I expect a little hug and a little kiss and a little smile. I, I, I don't want to have someone say, I can't be bothered with you. I'm paying the bills. You better be bothered with me. I'm buying your groceries and buying your stockings and putting on your hats. You better be bothered. You're not here what I'm saying. When I walk in this house... Jesus doesn't want me to say, I'm tired. I can't be bothered with you. Honey, he blessed me all day long. He kept me all day long. He's got his arms open. He's waiting to be embraced. He's waiting to be loved on. He's waiting to be told how wonderful he is. Excuse me. I, you better not give God the cold shoulder. Because the problem with the potentate is he won't mess with you. He'll just move on. He'll look for somebody to go... Don't you hate to try to be warm with someone who don't want to be warm? Don't you hate to shake hands with some people? It's like holding on to a dead fish. Hey, praise the Lord. Hey, how you doing? You're going to talk to some people and just, I'm so happy to be here. I can't hardly stand it. I don't know what kind of disease you have, but I don't want it, man. I'm going to find me some time. Hey, praise the Lord. How you doing? Ain't God good? Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Let me tell you the mercy I've received. I'm excited. You, you can be seated. I, 
I, I didn't mean to get a mess started so fast. I, I'm just trying to help you with it. Attendance cannot be primary. Contact must be primary. I got to get through. And sometimes to get through requires an apostolic assault. You're not getting it yet. You're supposed to be an apostolic aggression machine. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is trying to hold you back. I will bless the Lord. I will get a hold of God. I will. Yes, I will. Oh. Going to going to stand me down, will you? I don't want to be unkind to you folks. You're very sweet, but let me tell you something. And I've noticed how very modest and very nice you ladies dress, but let me tell you something. You men and ladies, if you dress too good to get stinky, you're dressed too good. If God hadn't kept you, you'd be in a whorehouse somewhere. You'd be in a bar somewhere. You'd be laying out in the street somewhere. But God, who is rich in mercy, snatched you out of the kingdom of darkness, brought you into the kingdom of light. I will get a little excited. Oh, hallelujah. You, you can sit down. I'm, I'm just trying to get to my message. I read that scripture for you. I, I like, could you throw it up on the screen? Luke 6, 17, 18, and 19. I want to go over that again because I, we need our mindset changed. And I'm going to make a statement. And a half, take this and use it all the time to be a blessing to you. You can expand on it. You know, I, I don't want to hurt your bishop. You're the kingpin around here, but listen to me. We Pentecostals have repented enough to get our sins forgiven, but we've not repented enough to see the kingdom. That's just what I thought. I repent enough so God forgives me, but I'm not going to repent enough so that I see through the eyes of the Spirit and I perceive the kingdom and I act the kingdom out. Watch what the Bible said. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service, which God says, I don't think it's unreasonable for you to give me the best. And be ye not conformed to this world, watch, but be ye transformed, here's how, by the renewing of your mind. You ready for this? Unless you get your mind renewed, you can't prove the kingdom of God and the will of God to nobody. And be not conformed to this world, but be a transfer, watch, by the renewing of your mind, but you might prove what is the good and the perfect and will. You can't prove the will of God to your pagan world if your mind is not renewed. And the world needs proof. It don't need more people telling them. Well, I'm going to make some statements. going to rock your socks. You ready for this one? Write this one down. Truth ain't enough. Oh, I know what Jesus said in John 8, 32. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Oh, how we like to quote that. But he ain't talking about the book. The truth was a person before it was a page. Jesus said, I am the truth. I, if you understand what he means, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, the only way the truth can emancipate you is you experience the personhood of the truth and not just the precept of the truth. Because you can learn the Bible and not know the author. You can quote scripture until your tongue falls out and hell will not be impressed. Sit, sit, sit down, sit down. You, you're not hearing me yet. I, I, I'm, I just feel like I just struck fire again right now. Well, Brother Slack teaches you better know the Bible, know the truth. I agree. 
But you got to understand something. The Bible said in the last days, one of the earmarks of the church would be, my sheep know my voice. Wait a minute. Not my word. You say, well, his, his word is his voice. Uh-uh, only in printed form. This just tells you what he's done. His voice tells you what he's fixing to do. Boy, I struck fire here right now. Well, I read my Bible all day. God bless you, you ought to, because that's the revealed mind of God. But he said, my sheep know my voice. Not my word, my voice. And another they will not follow. Because you can learn the word of God and never become sensitive to the voice of God. And every other day you've got another problem that you're trying to find a scripture to answer. But if you can get down in a prayer room somewhere, turn off the TV, turn out the lights, and let God reveal himself to you, his voice would bring you some direction. We've raised a generation that can quote the Bible but can't walk with God because God talks to his sheep. God communicates with his sheep, not just from the Bible. Now, now, now wait, so you don't walk away saying, Brother Arnold, say, oh, no. He will never communicate with you with his personal voice and in any way contradict or invalidate what he's already said. No, he won't do that. But... Please be seated. Oh, God. I should have left that. Boy, there's an Australian atheism. You know we're on the border of becoming apostolic atheists? Why? We dance and jiggaloo and carry on because we know the doctrine. We've raised a generation that knows doctrine. Says, oh, I believe God is and I believe the Bible is. I just don't believe he's talking anymore. I don't believe he's acting up anymore. You sound like the Church of Christ. Well, let's ask yourself something. When's the last time the Lord talked to you? Who, me? I'm just an apostolic believer. I'm a divine ambassador of God appointed to keep up the work of the kingdom. Who, me? I'm just here to pay tithes and drag funny and act funny. You and me? He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Watch what he said. He didn't say, if any man hear my knock, any bimbo can hear the knock. He said, if anybody hear my voice, you see, the knock gets your attention. The voice gives you an explanation who's talking. He said, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. We've got to become sensitive to the voice of God. I'm not talking about this mystic stupidity and ooh, I feel a ooh, I say, ooh, no, no, it's a bunch of junk. Don't do that stuff. But that God can give you impressions. And um, um, have I lost something here? Have you ever been in a coffee shop or I guess a tea place? And you had this faint something that says, go talk. And you looked over and went, and before you could do anything, you debated deity into silence. <laughs> Ever get an impression that you should call somebody or say something to someone or do something, and you don't respond to the impression? You notice how it fades down the hallway until it evaporates and vanishes? Guess what that was? The voice. See, we're, we're, we're waiting for God to say, hey! But God doesn't say, hey! God says, hey, uh, Slack, I need to talk to you for a minute. Because he talks in a still, small voice. And if you got the... And if you got the TV on and the radio on and the newspaper and you got everybody talking to you and you got all the music playing and you got all the fussing and all the caring going on, you can't hardly hear his still, small voice. And he's not going to, you know why God never talks loud? Lovers really don't ever yell. (laughs) 
Now you yell at your kids because they ain't listening. My mother used to have a terrible time with me when I was a boy. She said, ch- Jeffrey, now if she ever said Jeffrey Wayne, you want to pray for the Nazis to bomb New York because it was over. If she ever said Jeffrey Wayne, you knew judgment began at the house of God. And she'd say, Jeffrey Wayne, listen to me. I'm talking to you. And I'd be just looking the other way. And she'd say, look, parents are funny. Look at me when I talk to you. And being the little wise guy that I was, I said, Mom, I see with my eyes and I hear with my ears. And my mother says, and yes, you're fresh with your mouth. Whack. She didn't believe there was an 18-year-old kid in New York. She couldn't beat half to death. And she got angry when she had to yell and raise her voice. She said, there's no reason for me to yell. I ought to be able to just talk to you and you listen and respond. God is the same way. He doesn't want to have to yell over your busyness and yell over your crowd and yell over your diverse interests. He'd like to be able to just go, could I talk to you for a minute? You're not hearing me yet. I'm, I'm, I'm getting stuck in the mud here. When the Lord got ready to deal with Elijah, remember when he backslid? And he got in the cave. Remember that story? And there was, a, there was an earthquake, and there was a burning, blazing fire. Remember that? And a mighty wind rent the whole place apart. And each time it says, and the Lord was not in the earthquake, and he wasn't in the fire. You know what God was trying to do? He's giving this guy a test to see whether he can learn his voice or he's just moved by the spectacular. We've raised a generation that doesn't want the supernatural. They want the spectacular. And many times the supernatural is no more than... Let me see if I can get a witness here. When you got convicted, it wasn't people screaming and yelling and the music going. Whatever. I, it might have been a lot of noise going on, but when you got convicted and decided to repent, God just very gently just reached up and grabbed a hold of you and said, Talk to you. And I'm so glad he did because sometimes you couldn't get honest if it had to be out in the front. So he pulls you to the side and he just whispers, now we need a little help in this area right here and we need this taken care of. Come on, I wish. Have you ever been under conviction? Conviction is never boisterous and, and loud and crazy. Conviction is he grabs a hold of you and then in, in shame and embarrassment and guilt, he goes, now, now concerning this lust thing you've got. You... Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you glad he doesn't say, hey, let me tell you about Lucille. <laughs> Am I making sense yet? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not trying to cause you any problems. I, I just want you to, come on. Uh, uh, uh. It is so easy to live within precepts and be void of power. It is so easy to understand that truth declares, but power delivers. You can only get liberated when you experience the power of truth. Truth declares Power delivers. Moses had the truth, but Moses didn't put on a jailbreak because he had the truth. Pharaoh was unimpressed with the fact that he had a supernatural experience. He couldn't walk in and put on the biggest jailbreak recorded in human history and bring three million people out because he was talking to a bush. They thought the man was crazy. Could you imagine? Don't you think God's got a sense of humor? We get ready to send an ambassador, a prime minister, a representative. Man, we get his teeth brushed. He puts the odorant on. He gets a haircut. He's got a nice shirt and a tie. God, he puts somebody on with a bowling shirt on, with, with, with sheep manure between his toes, sunburn, and he stutters. You're not hearing me yet. And God says, I'm going to use you to put on a a worldwide jailbreak. I'm going to do it. Yeah, go ahead. And can you imagine how humiliating it was and how foolish it seemed to Pharaoh when the sunburned guy with all the stinky sheep smell all over him walks in with this little magic stick and says, I've I've been talking to to, to, a bush. (laughs) 
That's almost as crazy as when you try to tell your friends that you were talking to the Lord and the Lord was talking to you. They go, right. See, now they only stop laughing when all of a sudden the Lord shows up. And he said, well, what did the bush say? Well, the bush said, let my people go. He said, really? If you think I'm going to let these slaves of sin and Satan and Pharaoh be let go because you've had a spiritual experience, you're crazy. I ain't letting none of them go. So began the contest between two kingdoms as Pharaoh's magicians and sorcerers took on Moses. You see, hell's not afraid of your doctrine, and hell is not afraid of your previous experience. Hell is afraid of a present visitation of the power of the Holy Ghost. You can use scripture on them all you want. You can say, I bind you, I do this, I do that. And hell says, really? No kidding. That's a big deal. But the minute pff, God shows up and says, and I'm going to validate this word, and I'm going to back it up, that's when the hell says, now, you're not hearing me yet. I'm talking about you got to get violent about it because hell is not a respecter of persons either. And he doesn't care about your experience. He doesn't care how you were baptized. He don't care that you got the Holy Ghost. He wants to know, have you got more power than he's got? Have you got more clout than he's got? Because the only way he's going to leave is you got to make him leave. No, 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 am I? Let me try over here. Are you ready, Gertrude? I'm going to talk to you, okay? You, you can sit down. You, Gertrude. We got two, Lucille and Gertrude. That's fine. Look, you understand this? That when the Lord gets ready to set people free, there's always a clash between two powers. And they didn't let the Jews go, and they duplicated Moses' powers, counterfeited it four times. Moses did his little nifty stuff. They did their little nifty stuff. He did his nifty stuff. They did their nifty stuff. But when it got to about five and six, all of a sudden the magicians went, uh-oh. Uh, this ain't a trick. Uh, this is the real deal. And then all of a sudden they wanted to let him go, and God said, oh, no. We ain't getting off that easy. I'll let, I'll let your pharaoh tell me when my people can go as soon as I wreck your joint. And for the next four or five plagues, he destroyed their economy. He broke their health. He brought terror and fear into them. Then he killed their firstborn. And then Pharaoh said, you, uh, please go. You're not hearing what I'm saying yet. Until you get violent about what is right, hell will just stick its tongue out at you. I don't care what you say. I don't care you talk in tongues and dress funny and act funny. I, can give a, I don't give a flip about all that kind of stuff. But when you turn around and say, well, then I'll just make you. And he says, I like to see you make me. And God says, go ahead, make him. Because I've given you authority and I've given you power. You can use my spirit and you can use my name and you can bind sickness and you can bind death. Oh, yes, you can. You can cast out fear. You can cast out unbelief. You can bind these things. You can command the devil to get off your back and get away from your home and get out of your mind. We got to stop all this nice Christianity. Don't you understand? You're at war, man. You've been left here to assault the kingdom of hell. Just like David. Hey, Goliath didn't lay down because David had had some previous experiences. I killed the lion. I killed the bear. Old man Samuel anointed me with oil. Ain't you scared? That big behemoth of a man, nine and a half foot, the jolly green giant, the valley of Elah. Come here, boy. I'll rip your head off. I'll beat your brains and I'll kill you. I'll wipe you out. And David said, boy, you've got me ticked off now. now if you understand what he, when's the last time you ran towards your enemy? Bible said he ran towards Goliath. You come to me with sword and spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord. I come to you with a divine destiny. I come to you with a divine anointing. You think you're violent? I'm fixing to get violent.
Do you know what David killed Goliath with? I know he cut his head off with a sword, but you know what he knocked him down with? David killed him with what David took time to put in the bag. How's your spiritual reserves? You don't pray, you don't fast, you don't worship, you don't study, you don't witness, you ain't got nothing in the bag, hell ain't afraid of you, but every time you bow your head in prayer, you're making a deposit. Every time you repent, you're making a deposit. Every time you try to do something, and then when you need it, you can reach in that bag, and you, you can pull out a weapon of violence, and you can beat that which is trying to destroy you. Are you hearing me? You know what? Just stand, just keep standing for just a second. I don't care. The rest of you can sit just there. You, you know what the Bible says? It said a young lion roared against Samson. And being a good Pentecostal that he was, he went, oh. I'm just not the fighting kind. He, Samson wasn't afraid of the lion. Samson got ticked off that the lion dare try to intimidate him. No, no, you're not, you didn't miss it again. That, that went way, I, I'm in Melbourne right now. Whew. You missed that completely. It wasn't that Samson had an attitude about the lion. He's, there's the lion, fine. But when the lion went, rah, 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 he said, boy, you little punk, you. And the Bible said he ran, oh, I wish I could preach. He ran towards the roar. He ran towards the roar. You got to start challenging what's challenging you. You got to start intimidating what's intimidating you. Don't be held hostage because you don't know how. God is with you. If God be for me, who can be against me? What can be against me? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Come on, for about the next 60 seconds, let's get vowed. I'm going to fight until I'm going to pray until I'm going to worship until I'm going to get angry about it. You, you be seated for just a minute. I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm a brother, brother Slack. I told you before, go. The, the truth ain't enough. You got to experience the truth. You cannot believe the truth intellectually. I meet people all the time. I believe in Jesus. Well, so does the devil. When people turn around and say to me, well, I believe in God. I said, well, you're a fool if you don't. The Bible said the fool has said in his heart there is no God. If you believe in God, you're just one step ahead of a fool. Don't brag. <laughs> I'd like to ask you something, Flash, now that you say you believe in God. Do you know God? Right. Oh, now we're going to divide the boys from the men, the ladies from the girls. Do you know God? I'll tell you in the fear of God right now. I know God in a measure. I know so little about God, it gives me a headache. I get so crazy, these people, I know the Lord, oh, shut up. <laughs> you read Job, and he says, there was thunderings and lightnings and demonstrations in nature. And he said, and these are parts of his ways, but how little do we hear of him? 
Man, when God gives you the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all he did was take a portion of himself and said, there's an ounce for you, there's an ounce for you, there's an ounce for you. He's never been diminished. Now, that's a mystery, but he puts part of himself in here. Part of himself. See, the difference between me and you and Jesus, Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and he had the spirit without measure. You only have the earnest of your inheritance. Maybe you don't understand what that is in Australia. Earnest is the down payment. Earnest money. You ready? When you buy a car or a boat or a furniture, you give them earnest money. Watch. 10% down and the rest at closing. I got 10% down and I'm waiting for the closing. I'm going to see Jesus like he really is, and I'm going to have a body like unto his glorious body, and then I'm going to be like him. Uh, stay, stay with me. I, I'm struggling here just a little bit. Just stay with me. I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to go a little further. You ready for this one now? I told you truth was not enough. You had to experience the truth. You can't just say, I just believe the truth. You, that, that's, that intellectual stuff is stupid. You can't do that. that that's, not, that's not the same as knowing the truth and experiencing the truth. That's like a guy saying, you know, I just believe in love. Have you ever been in love? No. <laughs> you know, I, I just think kissing's great. Do you kiss a lot? I've never kissed anybody. <laughs> you know, I believe in that heart surgery stuff. Really? Have you had a bypass? No. So you got a guy with a theory, and then you have so, then you have somebody with an experience. And because you have an experience, don't let the devil hold you hostage because you don't have all the understanding you'd like to have. The God who gave you the experience, he's got all the understanding you need. He is wisdom. He is knowledge. He is power. He is glory. He is truth. He is, oh, I wish I, he is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and the offspring, the bright and the morning star. He's the root and the offspring of David. It is he that was alive, was dead, and is alive again. And I got him inside me. I'm a bad dude. I'm going to say this again as kindly as I can. It ought to be dangerous sitting next to you. Sit down. You know, you know the reason why most people sit in the same seat every service? It's safe. I always sit here. Why? Nothing happens. If you think I'm sitting up on that second row with those crazy gals, you are out of your mind. If you think I'm sitting up by that crazy choir, that ain't going to happen. I'm going to sit right here with the rest of the mummies. Well, go ahead and act like that. But if he's ever answered a prayer, if he's ever showed you mercy, if he ever blessed you, if he ever watched out for you, at least you can wave your hand once in a while and say, thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm trying to get to my sermon. I can't seem to get to it. Please stick with me just a few minutes, just a few minutes, and, and, I'll, and I'll try to finish. I haven't got started. I'll just try to finish. Are you ready for point number two? Now, now I'm going to mess with your Australian theology because you, you be the, 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 the in-country prophet. Good. I'm the visiting prophet. Here we go. Are you ready? The promises of God are not enough. I'll put, thank you for one applause and one hiccup. Thank you very much. Do you know that you can go to hell with the promises of God? Do you know that Israel was pregnant with promises for 40 years and died in the wilderness never experiencing any of them? Let me tell you what God showed me. I didn't steal it from a tape or a book. God showed it to me. God spoke to me and said, Jeffrey, you know what my promises are? I said, no, sir. 
He said, my promises are my revelations of my intention for people's lives. When I give people a promise, I'm revealing to them what I intend to do. And now I step back and I wait to see what they're going to do. Because promises cannot fulfill themselves. Promises are designed by God to inspire faith. To inspire courage. To inspire tenacity. To inspire action. When God gives you a promise, he expects you to say, hey, I believe that. I'm going to act on that. I'm going to grab that. I'm going to believe that. I'm going to experience that. That's mine. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not unifying this audience yet. I'm not helping you. Like, I'm trying to assist it out. Like, I'm trying to help. So do you get what I just said? Are you? Choir, you're on my side, ain't you? Okay. You understand? When God gives you a promise, it's like he wrote this blank check and said, this is what I plan on doing with your life. Now, as you act in faith and submission and confidence and obedience, the promises will be released to action. So their fulfillment is in your ballpark. Ain't nobody gets the Holy Ghost by accident. Nobody gets forgiven by accident. Nobody gets healed by accident. You respond to a promise. You hear the word of God. And if you repent, God will forgive you. And if you get baptized in Jesus' name, he'll remit your sin. And if you praise him with all your heart, he'll fill you with the spirit. He gives you a promise to show you his intention. Am I doing good yet? Just stay with me. Just stay with me. He's, he's trying to get us to move. That's why he said, ask, and you shall receive. Now watch. Shall receive is the promise. Ask is your part. That's his intention, my promise. I'm going to let you receive. What do I do? Ask. Seek. Seek. And you shall find. The promise is you shall find. Your part, seek. Knock, and it shall be opened. That's the promise. Your job, knock. Watch. For everyone that asks, receives. And everyone that seeks, they find. And to everyone that knocketh, it shall be. It's got to be. It will be. It has to be. Open. Don't you get it yet? Watch, God, God gives a promise. See, I, I haven't got to my Bible study yet. I'm so sorry. I started with, with Elijah. Remember what the Lord said? Watch what he, he gives him a promise. Go show yourself to Ahab. Now I'm going to mess with your theology. And I'll send rain. Next verse. So he went to show himself to Ahab, and he did. Guess what? No rain. Is God lying? Nope. Well, what's the deal? Oh, I forgot to tell you part two. God has an equation that many times you have to pray the promise into reality. You're not hearing me. Gina, you got me? You ready? He says, go show yourself to Ahab. I'll send rain. Hey, Ahab. No rain. What does he do? Builds the altar. Fire falls, kills all those false prophets, goes up on the mountain. You need to read it again. The Bible said he cast himself on the ground and put his head between his knees. Isn't that unique that God would give a physical posture of a man? Why would he tell us he put his head between his knees? Two reasons. So he couldn't see the negative, and two, it's the fetal position. He was fixing to give birth to an answer. When God gives you a promise, you need to start saying, Now, Lord, do as thou hast said. Help my unbelief. Cause me to become desperate. Cause me to become diligent. Cause me to pray this thing till it comes to pass.
And the Bible said, he said, told his servant, go look out and see if there's anything. He said, there's nothing. Let me tell you something. When you get ready to get, oh, I feel like talking. When you get ready to get a promise from God fulfilled, you're going to have to deal with a lot of negatives. You're going to have to deal with a lot of obstacles. You're going to have to deal with a lot of reports. Said, there's nothing. There's nothing. You know, there's only one thing worse than there's nothing. It's got worse. It's got worse. It's got worse. Fine. What did the word of God say? It's going to get better. Go back to praying. Go back to praying. Get violent about it. Get violent about it. Invade the supernatural and cause it to come into this world so that God, who is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent, has he spoken? Shall he not do it? Has he said? Shall he not make it good? I feel like preaching. Are you ready? He said, go again. Go again. How much? Are you ready for this? Here's what you do. You go again until nothing becomes something. You go again until the answer shows up. You go again until God honors his word. You go again until God does what he promised to do. Can I preach a little longer? A little longer? Mom, I was stand up because you're fixing to get up on this one anyway. And, and the Bible said he went seven times. Seven times. And he says, got anything yet? Got anything yet? It takes, a, it takes a tenacity of spirit to keep going when you keep getting a no, a no, a no, a no. You sweet people are under doctor's care, and the doctor says, it's not getting any better. It's getting worse. Go again. Go again. Go again. Go again. God has promised. God is not a liar. He's not playing games with your life. Just go again. One or two things, he'll either fix it or he'll tell you why he's not fixing it. And the Bible says the seventh time, he says, you see anything? He said, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. He said, in fact, I see a cloud of dust. And all my life I've preached that, I've read it, I've studied it, I've listened to people preach it, and it wasn't until just recently God gave me a re See, he's got to give me revelations. I'm too stupid to learn this stuff. My brain doesn't work like his brain works. God's just got to, here, Jeffrey, here, Jeffrey. And so when I read that thing, I said, and there's a cloud of dust about the size of a man's hand. And he turns around and tells Ahab, Get out and go so the rain doesn't stop you. And I said, what made Elijah say there was going to be a rainstorm over a cloud of dust? And the Lord took me to Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 2, and it says, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Oh. Elijah saw the dust and said, the boss is coming. <laughs> An answer's coming. The guy who made the promise is fixing to fulfill it. Hey, you may not get everything you want, but if you get a speck of dust, if you get a little bit of change, you got it. You got an answer coming your way. The dust or the clouds of his feet. Can I, can I just have a few more minutes, please? Please be seated. I want to say this in the fear of God until you're fine. Uh, pastor, and I, I, I really mean this. I'm not, I'm not being unkind. But we as Pentecostals have so been afraid of the excesses of spiritual gifts that we have raised a generation that tolerates total abstinence. We'd rather have the absence of something that have an excess of something. And God is turning the tables now and saying, no, 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 no. Just because somebody misuses the gift, it shouldn't make you say, I don't want them working. Just because you hear some person, maybe a well-intentioned person or maybe a dumb dumb, gives a message in tongues, an interpretation, and if that was God, there's ice cream parlors in hell. And you just listen and say, whoa. And I've had people say, see, that's why I don't believe in that tongues and interpretation. Listen, my friend, just because somebody makes a mistake, remember that all the gifts of the Spirit work by faith. And God uses imperfect people to try to manifest perfect things. 
And just because people have abused the supernatural, that does not mean you shouldn't get hungry to use the supernatural. Do you know that God is not upset with you when you learn how to do some things? We think if God looks at us and we make a mistake in spiritual things or supernatural things, God is seriously ticked off. No, no. God is ticked off when you don't try. I, I wish I could get a witness right about now. I never was angry at my daughter, Dina Leanne, because she fell off the bike. But I was angry when she refused to try to ride it. I put her on that little bike, and I walked along with her like all dads do. Come on. Come on. Let's go. You're right. Come on. You're fine. And the front wheel's wiggling, and she's going, I'm scared. You're fine, baby. You're fine. You're fine. Come on. Let's go. You got it. You got it. We got it. And all of a sudden, I'm okay, Dad. And I let her go, and she's just wiggling. She's wig- I said, hey, you got it. She hit that first crash. <laughs> Busted elbow, skinned up knee. I'm never going to ride a bike again. I hate the bike. I told you I couldn't ride a bike. You made me ride a bike. I said, shut up. Get on that bike. <laughs> Call me Gentle Jeff. <laughs> Put a little mercurial on her elbow, on her knee. I said, come on, stop it. I don't want to get, get on the bike. You're going to enjoy this. <laughs> now, I know it sounds funny, but I went to the after about three more times. Then she was the one that said, you don't need to walk with me anymore. I had to ride this bike. <laughs> and then I was the one who had to tell her, no, you can't ride 12 blocks away from here. <laughs> no, you can't go to Puerto Rico from here. You go, no, you stay in the neighborhood now. And you know what happened? She got better with the use. And I didn't get mad because she made mistakes and tripped and fell with the body. Don't you get it? God, who is wonderful and beautiful and perfect, does not get mad at his people when we try to move in the spirit and we try to exercise in the spirit. And sometimes we hit it and sometimes we miss it. I'm perf- I am totally convinced that God looks at us when we miss it and says, that's my girl. That's my boy. Well, you're a little off now, but you're getting better, ain't you? Come on, try it again. Come on, do it again. Because the Bible said, they who by reason of use have their senses exercised thereby. You get better the more you try. You get better the more you do it. I've preached too long already and haven't got to my sermon. I'm trying to talk to you about violence. And the violent take it by force. And the healer's in the house. And the crippled guy's outside with them four dodos carrying him. And they can't get through. Boy, there's a message. Preach that one. The problem always is the press. They couldn't get through for the press. Press means people, obstacles, barriers. Whatever keeps you from your answer is the press. But you've got to deal with the press. You've got to get some way to break through. Now, when they got in, Brother Slack, the press was in the way, and they could have said, oh, well, you know, I mean, it was just, we tried. God knows we tried. Oh, stop that. God knows we tried. You can do something more than that, you little dirt bag. Try something, you little wussy. <laughs> Violent. You got to start telling yourself, I will not be denied. I will not be denied. I will get my answer. I will get God to promise to what he's told me he's going to do. I'm going to experience what he promised no matter what it takes me to get it. Give me, give me five minutes and I'll finish, okay? I'm not done. I haven't even started. You, you understand what happened? You know the story. You've heard it preached lots of times. They carried him up on the side of the roof. Can you see him up there with, 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 with saws and crowbars? And Jesus is teaching this nice little Pentecostal Bible study. And, and while he's talking, sawdust is falling in his face. And you see the fish. And see the fish. And then they ripped out part of the You know, I think that was the funniest time in history when he's teaching all these guys who are word people. And they rip back the top of the roof and he kind of looks up through the sawdust and they kind of go. 
Uh, excuse me, Mr. Jesus. I, I know you were teaching the morning Bible study. But, but we got one hellacious problem up here on the roof. And this poor slob can't walk. And he actually is dumb enough to believe you could heal him. And so if you don't mind, just, just, put a, just, put a, just put a period or a comma at the end of your last sentence. We're going to let Lou down here. And I can see Jesus watching his body come down. I, I'm a sick man. I need therapy. I, I can just see Jesus going, cool. Ever more cool. Now, if I ever seen faith, I just seen it. And Jesus fixed him spiritually, and Jesus fixed him physically. You know, maybe you never read that like I read it in Mark 2, but the Bible said they let him down by the ropes. Apparently, when they let him down by the ropes, the ropes dropped, which told Jesus, I don't plan on going out the way I came in. It's time to put down your crutch. It's time to put down the thing you're leaning on. It's time to get rid of that stuff that's making you a hostage. God wants to heal you. God wants to forgive you. God wants to bless you. God wants to help you. But you got to get hungry and violent. Just remain standing. I'll just, I'll just stop. Come on, music people. We'll play something scary here. Are you ready? And, and Jesus is, is walking by. And blind Bartimaeus is sitting by the roadside. Can you imagine being blind? Hey, what's, what's all the fracas going on here, buddy? Uh, well, Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth is coming by. Who's that? Jesus. Hey! We take prayer requests at 11 and 2. Well, I'm going to mess with your theology. You people, you people that don't believe in divine healing right now, wonder what kind of stupid picture that would have been if Jesus would have said to Bartimaeus, I'd like to heal you, but you're learning so much about the love of my father, I'm going to just let you stumble through life. Hey, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Hey, shut up. Hey, hey. We're having a mobile church service here. Cool it. Stop it. It's always easy for people that don't have a bunch of hell and trouble and problems to tell you to cool it. People who never get violent about their walk with God always want to tell you about, you know, I don't think you need all that stuff. And I see that Bartimaeus, man, I don't know what kind of super tonsils he had, screaming to the top of it, hey, Jesus, have mercy on me. If you read this Bible and I read it to you, the next verse says, and Jesus stood still. There's one to preach, the cry that stops God. When violence laid a hold of the master and stopped him on his way to the cross. And he turns around and called him, said, bring him on over here. Man, I wish I could preach a message. Jesus answers knee mail. And you know what he did? He healed him. He only healed them because he become violent. Let me ask you as I close. When is the last time you decided to summons the supernatural to help you? Remember Hannah? Couldn't get pregnant. Had that dumb gal. Remember her? Penina. That old bag that lived in the other part of the tent that was producing kids like a rabbit. She had kids, 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 kids. And Hannah, her belly never gets filled. And she's never fulfilled as a woman. She can't have this baby. I got another revelation, brother. God let me have it. I didn't steal it. God let me have it. And the Bible said that he per she perplexed her and provoked her every day. Oh, here's all my kids. Where are yours? 
oh, I've got to nurse my baby now. You, you go wash the dishes, okay? And every day, the Bible said, until she just grieved her and made her filled with sorrow. And I said, God, why did you let that happen? This old bag driving this poor girl crazy who wants to have a baby. What? Why are you doing that? He says, oh, see, you've misread that. You think I let Penina get on her nerves. No, no. I put Penina in her life to get her on her knees. And when she got on her knees in the temple and got vocal and got violent about wanting a child, God gave her the baby. Now, I've kept you a long time. Excuse me for not preaching well. I've heard myself better. But right now, as we try to close this thing, why don't you for 60 seconds in your own way get violent? I mean, you don't have to get vocal and lift the roof. Get violent about what you want from God and what you need from God. Because your adversary is trying to tell you, calm down. You don't need all that screaming and yelling and clapping and carrying on. Take it. Really? If Jesus was passing by right now and he didn't plan on coming by again, I think you'd get violent. In fact, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to get violent right now. If you need anything from God, healing, forgiveness, mercy, if maybe your joy has diminished or your drive or desire has diminished, leave where you are, let's fill the altar full, and let's have a time of violent prayer. Come on. Make your nothing become something. Boy, it's too quiet for me. Come on, Gertrude. Strike up the band. Let's go.